Okay, so we've seen two things. The first is that the person being sired by God, to use John's term in 1 John, where it says born of God, that really should be translated with a progressive being sired by. It's talking about a continuing action. And the Greek verb there is genao, and it doesn't really mean be born, it means be sired. It's talking about the parent, the source of the parent, not the fact that you're being born. On the one hand, you've got a situation where if you're being sired by God, you're getting the mind of Christ in you in progressive deposits. Each such moment where that's occurring, that's a moment that's going to forever live to God. It's something He's doing. And that's what all the rewards in 1 Corinthians 3 are based on. What He does. And He's doing it to you. You are the property of Christ. So you end up getting rewarded because it happened to you. I want to really stress that. The cross happened to Christ. He let it happen. He said yes. There's no merit in his saying yes. The merit was elsewhere. The merit was in the I mean, it's a tripartite thing, and it's not just one person. God the Father is imputing sins to Christ on the cross. In many ways, you can say that's not a good deed because he's hurting his own son. How do you call that a good deed? We naturally want to say that Christ is doing a good deed at that time, But really what he's doing is receiving something. So if you're going to call what happened to Christ on the cross as a good deed, and we all will, then the good deed was for him to receive something from God. You get that? The good deed of the cross, the work of the cross is a receiving not you doing something you receiving something that's what happened on the cross all of us know that he was hit with our sins on the cross and that's what paid for us so it isn't something he did it's something he got 2nd Corinthians 521 He who knew no sin was what? Made sin. The actual literal Greek there is saying, He, Father, made him, Son, who knew no sin. Still talking about the Son. And then it's a comma in English, sin. That's following the word order in the Greek. And it was very dramatic. So that we become, that's Hina again, takes the subjunctive of purpose, the righteousness of God in him. In other words, because Father hit Son in his humanity with our sins, that's the protasis of the, of the clause, the first part of the clause. The result, Hina, because it's a result, blending of purpose and result, you can talk to any grammarian about that. The Hena Clause, in the second part, is what happened as a result. We're made the righteousness of God in in Him, Christ. In Christ. Not of ourselves. In Him. In other words, our sins went into Him, so we are in Him. And then we are pronounced, made, become, literally. The righteousness of God in him. Become. It's genomai in the Greek. We become something. We don't do something. We become something. That's juridical. Juridical, 
sins that he did not commit were stabbing him. That's Isaiah 53, 5. Result? We become. Not we do. He didn't do anything. He received something. As a result of him receiving our sins, we receive his righteousness. It's an exchange. That's why Paul uses huper. Huper means over. One thing standing over another. With the result that a substitution takes place. That's Romans 5.8. Unfortunately, it's mistranslated as just four. He died for our sins. He died as a substitute for our sins. Same idea as in Isaiah 53.10, where the preposition peri is used in the Greek instead of huper. Because back in those days, you know, back in the 3rd century B.C., Perry was the, the preposition. Who Perry is a later preposition used in the same way. Okay? So, that's it. He receives something. And therefore we become something because of what he received. So we receive also. We receive a becoming of his righteousness in him. You got that? It's real important. So if you're going to call across a good deed and there's not a sane person on the planet who wouldn't, even if they don't believe in it, it's a deed that is a receiving. The good deed is the receiving of something from God. That's a God deed. We all would, you know, you can't even argue against that. It's a receiving. It is not a doing. Christ is not doing anything. He's receiving something from Father. And we receive from Father His righteousness, because He didn't sin. During that process, He stayed sinless. We receive His righteousness. But His righteousness was produced by what? What He knew. And what He knew was produced by what? Matthew 4.4 4. Learning and living on Bible. In other words, God puts the Bible in your head. God makes it work. You can't make it work. You, you can't even find it in your head. He makes it work. He creates it in your head. He runs it in your head. That's why we have the command to be filled with the Spirit. That's why we need 1 John 1 9. Okay, but that's all passive too. I sinned, Dad. That's just admitting. There's no, I'm not doing a good deed there. I'm admitting I did a bad deed. And then what does it say in 1 John 1 9 at the end? He's faithful and just to what? Purify us. Katarizo. Not just cleanse, purify. Purify. That means everything. And it's purify us from all adikia. That means malfeasance by a judge. Malfeasance by someone in public office. Yeah, because you're royal family of God. And when you sin, that's malfeasance. It's translated unrighteousness, which is a little too vague. Okay? You're purified from that. That's also something you receive. And now you're pronounced in the spirit, sinless, between sins, literally. But you're sinless at that moment. You get the point? You get the parallel? Until your next sin, you're sinless at that moment. Because you've been purified the last time you used the verse. So until your next sin, from the moment that you use that verse, until your next sin, you're sinless too. And it's something you received. And you can only stay between sins or, you know, protect, be protected against sins by using Bible. Because that's what Christ did. It's an 
it's a it's an entire parable. The difference with us is that we sin and we are sinless only at moments. In his case, it was all moments. And it's in all events a receipt, not a doing. You receive the word in your head. He received the word in his head. Matthew 4, 4. He lived on it. Okay, so he's receiving the benefit of the word in his head. And that produced more thinking. That produced more understanding of what he, you know, the Old Testament at that time. And he parlayed it into a whole series of thinking inside his head. And so what? He became something. The way, the truth, and the life. He didn't do something. He became something. So when we are baptized in him on the cross, 2 Corinthians 5.21, we become something. Juridically. That's why we get saved. Now, that's the first thing. It's a receipt. A good deed that's a God deed is a receipt. God's doing all the doing. You're just receiving it. You with me on that? In order for it to be good enough for God, Romans 4, the only good that counts is God's level. No reason to boast. God has to do all the work. And if he does, it's infinite quality. The scope of the work is for whatever those moments are. And there's a sort of corridor of what gets built during those moments. But the size of it within its size is of infinite quality. Okay? It's an infinite quality work of a particular size over a particular time that got done to your soul. Because you are juridically pronounced righteous in Christ, but your actual thinking is still the same all, same all, until you get enough Bible in your head to change your thinking. Well, you got to get a lot of Bible in your head before that's going to happen because the Bible's huge. And there's a whole lot to learn and you're learning all this discrete information and it doesn't make sense for a whole long time. Just like anything else you do in life. The minute you get your first computer and you've never worked on one before, you hit the power button and it's like, what? What do I do now? And it takes weeks or months. You know, sometimes a year depends on, you know, how much time you spend on it to get proficient. So notice, you need to spend time. There's discrete things you learn in anything. Even the alphabet, when you were a kid, you first learned the alphabet. You learned certain words, see, spot, run. Well, spot running, how relevant is that? Well, but you're a kid, you don't know anything. That's, you know, a huge increase for you. You see what I'm getting at? And then you learn how to construct a sentence, and then you learn how to construct a paragraph, and then you learn how to construct a page, and then you're able to actually think in terms of principles. You start with concrete and you go to abstract. That's what differentiates the human from the animal. The animal can't do any abstract thinking. You see? It's gradual. It's accretive. But each such instance is a moment of learning. In this case, we're talking about spiritual learning that only God can do. It's of infinite quality, but it only lasts a moment. That it's going into your head, and it's got a certain amount of learning that you're getting that needs repetition and other information before it's going to grow a lot. But in all events, it's passive. All you're doing is saying yes. You don't have the slightest clue 
how the spiritual CPU is working because the Holy Spirit's the only one who knows how to operate it. You don't have any idea what file folders in your head this information's going into. You only know it's there. And when you want to understand something, John 14, 26, he calls it to your mind. He operates the whole computer in your head. The whole thing. You only know how to turn on the power button, which is 1 John 1, 9. That's all you know. That's all you ever know. Everything else is just like, well, okay, now what? And when you hear me talk about verses and videos, that's John 14, 26 operating. Because I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to say next. He's feeding me. And if, I, if I'm feeding myself, it'll become real obvious. And if he's doing the feeding, it'll also become real obvious. This is not human knowledge. It's playing in a human being, that's all. Now, we go to the second part. Satan's argument is good deeds. His argument is good deeds because why? Because he flunked the first thing. The first thing was a receiving. We just covered that. Receiving from God, him pouring himself into your head. Satan went so far with that, and then he hit his own Waterloo. Okay? He, at some point in his learning couldn't stand the fact that it was all passive, that it was all receiving. He wanted to somehow think of himself as being worthy of God because he was so uncomfortable being less than God and so uncomfortable with this being a total receiving process. That's why the cross is structured as it is. I mean, that's not the main reason, but that's one reason is to show Satan and company, look, it's a receiving. And you can go all the way to a cross, which no angel ever had to do. That's the theme of Hebrews 1 and 2. And it's still a receiving. This is the good deed. You want a good deed? This is as good as it gets. Paying for all the sins of mankind? And I submit the angels too, but that'll be the topic of a later video. Okay? You can't get any better than that. You can't get any more oneness than that. You want to talk about something that's worthy? Well, hello, the cross is as worthy as it gets. And it was all receiving. That's the lesson God's trying to get across to Satan and company. Because, you know, they could change their mind tomorrow and believe in Christ also. What, he's going to extend that offer to us and not have it already be true for them? Why are they called elect angels versus non-elect angels? We're called elect. What, God would elect us but not the angels? Well, but we know he elected the angels. Okay? So, what, salvation is available to any human being but not available to all angels? Well, you know it is. But we also know that not all angels say yes. And if you don't want God, he won't elect you either. He paid for it. Christ paid for it. But you can elect against the will. That's the theme of Hebrews book, Hebrews chapter 9. The will was executed by Christ. He died. Okay, but we're the beneficiaries and we can elect against the will if we want and the whole book of Hebrews is warning them how the temple's going to go down. Because it was written in 68 AD. Temple's going to go down. Don't, you know, don't shrink back. That's the end of Hebrews 10. Don't shrink back. Or else you're going to die. Okay. Here today, while it's yet today. Hebrews 3 and 4. That's the whole idea of the, the letter. So, don't you think the same message is going out to Satan and company? Why would God go to this much trouble? Why isn't Satan and company already in hell now? But it's not true. They're not there yet. 
That's Matthew 25, 41. It's reserved, but it hadn't happened yet. There's no lake of fire yet. That comes in what? Revelation 20. And that's when the devil and his angels are cast in. Not now. Okay. So the second side to this is Satan's side. Satan's side says, well, it's not right that I just receive, receive, receive. Easy believism. You hear Satan's argument echoed all over Christendom. Lordship salvation, that's Satan's argument. Okay? Work salvation, that's Satan's argument. You can lose your salvation, that's Satan's argument. Both Calvinism and Catholicism are spouting Satan's argument. You can do something to lose it, or if you don't have this kind of behavior or that kind of behavior, you were never saved in the first place. And pretty much every other denomination, rec you know, reflects the same argument. People just can't stand it that all you do is receive salvation. Never mind the Bible uses that phrase. They receive salvation. It's something you receive. It's not something you work for. You don't repent of your sins to be saved. Christ did all the work on the cross. That's it. Okay, well, Satan doesn't like that. Satan can't stand that it's 100% God's work and we just benefit. So 1 Corinthians 13 was his waterloo. 1 Corinthians 13 is about getting something. The head in your head. The head is called love. And anything else you do is what? Uten or uden. Nothing. Paul learned what Satan didn't learn. Paul, therefore, obviously through the Holy Spirit doing it to him, beat Satan. Christ beat Satan. Paul is a reflection of what happened to Christ. So can you be, so can I be. The system that works for Christ works for everybody. So it's only a question of which side are you going to go with. The God deed side, which is totally receiving. And you hit the power button. 1 John 1 9. And that's all. You're going through motions where you sit under your male only pastor. And then you're talking to God about it all day long. Learning and living on Bible. Those four things. Those are all motions that you go through. But honey... Your emotions don't accomplish the power any more than you saved yourself. You're just saying yes like you did to the gospel. Only now you're saying yes to all this Bible stuff. And it goes into your head. You have no idea how it got there. John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit runs it. Ephesians 5, the Holy Spirit runs it. And you better use 1 John 1, 9 so that you're not, you know, sitting there on your own thinking that you're spiritual. Or you can vote with Satan's side and be all proud of yourself and trying to do it yourself, accomplishing nothing. Just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. See, Satan failed the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13, so he didn't complete the chapter. Yeah, it's a chapter in the Bible for us, but the process has always been the same. It's the process Christ went through. Now, I'm going to close this. I'm going to close this with a sort of really sad... Um, I don't know, I guess I have to call it a warning. If you go Satan's route... You're going to think you're spiritual. That's the warning in 1 John. The guy who's wandering around in the dark thinks he's in the light because he's not naming his sins to God. He will not admit that he sinned. And unfortunately, about, I don't know, at least 50% of Christianity, because they refuse to admit their sins to God, 
twist 1 John into claiming that it's only for the unbeliever. Never mind that John is addressing the letter, just like every other New Testament letter, is addressed solely to believers. Just like every believer in the Old Testament had to bring the animal to the priest, name his sin to God, in order to be clean. If you didn't believe in God, you didn't bring an animal to the priest. So no unbeliever brought an animal to the priest to get his sins named to God. Because if you don't believe in God, you don't bring an animal to a priest. That ought to be obvious. Okay, but see, this is the flip side. This is the warning. When you're taking Satan's side, and you're all hung up on good deeds, and you're in the dark, but you think you're in the light, Satan bids himself out as an angel of light. You think you're just like you're just thinking just like he does. So when you look at First John, you can't read it. Therefore, you make these really embarrassing, incredibly embarrassing mistakes with scripture that everybody else can see how stupid you are. But you can't. Because you're in the dark. Thinking you're in the light. So all those people saying you gotta work to be saved or repent to be saved or you can lose your salvation or you gotta make Christ Lord to be saved that's laughable absolutely laughable only an insane person would twist scripture like that only an insane person would look at first John and say that's a passage for unbelievers John's using the first person plural huh can you not read that? If we confess our sins. John's talking. He's including himself. Okay? If they had to name it in the Old Testament, you got to name it in the New Testament. And John is saying, if we. And he's just finished saying that the basis for being able to name your sins is the cross, just like it was in the Old Testament. We look back to the cross, the Old Testament people look forward to the cross. In both events, you're naming your sins to a God you've already believed in, you're already saved. So you have to be mentally ill to say that you have to repent of your sins to be saved. You have to be mentally ill to say lordship salvation. You have to be mentally ill to say that you can lose your salvation or that unless you exhibit certain behavior you were never saved in the first place. Those are statements made by people who are acutely on that topic. Mentally ill. Because the plain Bible proves that what they're saying is completely wacko. It's as if they were blind and cannot read it. So what I'm trying to say here is, you know, people say, well, how can Satan look at God all this time and not get it? Well, this is how. He will not admit that he's wrong. No offense to you guys, not all you are like this, but there are a whole bunch of men out there who have just way too much testosterone. And they will stick in their heels, and no matter how the evidence goes against them, they, 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 they're right, they're right, they're right, they're right. Of course, there are a whole lot of women that have too much testosterone in them, too. No matter how much evidence shows up against them, they're right, they're right, they're right, they're right. This is what John is talking about in First John, when he sets up the straw man, the guy who's walking in the dark. He does it about every couple of verses throughout his epistle. I mean, I've had people come on my videos and say the most uh, weirdest things that are so obviously untrue, you just have to facepalm. You know, a King James only person comes in and he's showing a section, section 58 of Jacinius, which proves what he's saying is incorrect. But he thinks that very section of the book proves him correct. And anybody who's reading what he's showing on screen just has to face palm. Hi, you just proved yourself wrong. What, what makes you think you proved yourself right? You're saying this black text proves that 
blue is true. Okay, but it's black text that you're showing, not blue. So you didn't prove black true. You're now black and blue from what you posted. Another guy come on one of my videos and insists that there's no such thing as stars in the sky. They're all angels because angels are called stars in the Bible. Okay. What do you say to that? And then another guy comes on one of my videos and says that, oh, well, you only showed one verse. And the screen of the video itself is showing actually two chapters of verses. The screen alone. Before you listen to the audio, which is mentioning about eight or nine more verses, and before you look at the video description, which has about 12. Actually, full chapters are listed. So what do you mean one verse? And it just didn't matter. You, it's like, hello, did you see this and this and this and this and this? It wouldn't matter what I say. See, that's Satan's position. He's staring God in the face 24-7. And that just makes him convince himself all the more that he's right. That's what good deeds does to you. Satan is the ultimate good deeder. He only sponsors sin in order to make good deeds look better, so we'll get more hooked on them. And he's hooked the whole human race on good deeds. That's passed off as being spiritual, so that you can't see what really is spiritual, which is receiving something from the Spirit. See, it's called spiritual because of the person who's doing it. If it's spiritual, the Spirit is doing it. Not you. And even Christ himself on the cross received power from the Spirit and received the imputation of our sins from Father. And himself didn't do anything. So, hello, that's what good is. If you do it, it's due to. Satan can't accept that. Because it means he's wrong. And anybody who's on Satan's side is going to be that stubborn. And the really sad part about this is it means that incompetent and that embarrassing. Because it's really obvious even to us little humans how wrong Satan is. That we, we start to like feel sorry for him. Don't you feel sorry for Satan? I mean, how can you not feel sorry for him and the demons? How can you not feel sorry for the atheist? How can you not feel sorry for the person who shakes his fist at God and makes some of the most incredibly stupid arguments you've ever heard in your life? How can you not feel sorry for the carnal Christian who presents or states things that his, his mere words are so incredibly bad you just have to face palm. You don't even know how to reply. That's how bad it is if you're a good teeter. That's the kind of life you're living if you're a good teeter. There's only one kind of good deeds and that's God deeds. And if you could read the Greek you would see that the Bible makes very careful distinction between a good deed that God does and a good deed that you do. And how it's always comparing the two to show that what you do is doo-doo. And that's 1 Corinthians 3. Gold, silver, precious stones. Only God can make them. Wood, hay, stubble. Wood is made by man cutting down a tree that God made. Hay is made from taking some plants and drying them out. And stubble is what's left over after the animals have eaten the hay. Animals. There's no comparison between 
wood, hay, stubble, and gold, silver, precious stones. None at all. There's no comparison between what you do in your body and what God does to you. There's no way to please God or do what pleases God except what He does to you. Hebrews 11, 6. Estinde pistis apizamenon, hopostes is pragmaton, elachos ublepomenon. It's about Christ thinking on trial. Hebrews 11, 1. Now, if you make it about something else, you're making a fool of yourself, just like Satan's doing. And when you make a fool of yourself, you will become so incompetent that you will bandy, flash around what you think is evidence proving you right that proves you wrong. And everybody else will look at what you think is evidence proving you right and they'll just face bomb. That's what Satan's doing right now and we all can't figure it out. How can he be so dumb? So that's the sign of a Christian who's on Satan's side. He bandies about ideas, what he thinks is evidence of him being right because he thinks it's a good deed. He's crusading. And all you can do is look and say, oh my, this person is unwell. And what you do next if you vow to yourself, please God, don't let me be like that person. Please remind me when I'm like that person, because we all get that way. And then, when you're between sins, pray for that person. Because he's in just as sad a shape as Satan, and he'll never understand 1 Corinthians 13. Peace out.